Chapter six, business to business markets. Now, one of the things that you need to understand about the way marketing is thought about, both in the academic sense and the business sense, is that we have two distinct approaches. We have the business to consumer, which is what chapter five is about with consumer behavior, and the business to business, which is what this chapter is covering. Now, in this text, business to business gets a lighter treatment. It's a smaller component part. It's a smaller component part of the course, but it is still an element that if you are interested in, you can use for assessment tasks. The other aspect of business to business is that we will periodically be mentioning it in other parts of the course. So when we're talking about advertising or product design or pricing, even distribution, there'll be a small discussion of, well, this is predominantly consumer oriented, but here's your business to business alternatives. So looking at this in overview, what we're looking at in this chapter is treating another business as your customer. So the plan here is that all the decisions that you would want to make about target markets and market segmentation you treat the business as your target audience rather than a group or an individual consumer. The trick here is that the business is not itself a sentient object. What you are looking at is the business changes the way the consumer, the individual who is making the decisions within the business, will operate and make their decisions. It does not change the fact that that's going to be a human at the other end of the purchasing process. So some of the consumer behavior techniques, some of the consumer behavior elements still kick into gear and still become relevant and important. It's just that they're moderated through the business buying behavior. So in terms of what a business, business to business market looks at, we're looking at this from the point of view of manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers. We're looking at where you are buying and selling to another firm. Most of the time in business to business, we're looking at from the point of view of the buying and selling that involves products that will then be either on sold to end consumers or will be converted into a larger product. So you're buying raw materials or processed materials to create your own product. So what makes the business to business market unique compared to the business to consumer? Well, one of the aspects is that you quite often have the geographic concentrations. You'll find businesses cluster. Even down in things like in the retailing, you'll find restaurants will cluster together. There'll be a restaurant strip or there'll be a car market where in a consumer sense, consumers are more widely distributed. And in business to business, geographic concentration is quite a common occurrence partly through uh, legal aspects such as zoning. So you'll find light industrial areas or heavy industrial areas. So industries of a like kind will cluster together because of resource options as well. So if there's one port in town, all the distribution suppliers will be close to that port. All the retailers will go and cluster together in the one major retail chains or retail strips. Because what we're looking at is if we can bring the customers to us collectively, then we all stand to benefit. Other factors that are important to consider in this area is business to business quite often has a smaller number of customers. If you are supplying high, high quality touchscreen to Apple, you don't need another customer. In fact, Apple will probably try and sign you up so that your particular product can't be used in someone else's uh, products or someone else's end product. So what we're looking at here is a small number of customers and quite often exclusivity arrangements. The other thing that we're looking at in here is the size of the purchase. For the most part, consumers do not buy in bulk, do not buy in millions of units. If you consider the number of cans of soft drink that would be created on a day and sold in a day, the business business market can deal with much greater volumes. And you find yourself, when you look at the business to business options, one of the aspects here is the idea of being the bulk breaker, where you buy a million units of something, so you can just break that up into smaller parts and smaller packages to on sell to different sized retailers. 
but still, the size of the purchase in terms of dollar and volume can often be significantly higher than what you'll find in a, a consumer market. So, one of the things I just want to point out to you, I'm going to ask you in the uh, week summary slides to be able to tell the different demands apart. I want you to read this section, partly because this is one of these elements where I want you to look at the four different parts and see how they would impact on your decision making if you're going to go and use business to business as your framework for your assessments. What I want to talk about here is in the business to business marketplace, we have different ways of classifying our business markets. So we think about this as a form of segmentation. So we've got the total business markets, so everything in the business to business operation. Then we have people whose role it is, is to be in the production end. So these are either the creators of the, the creators, acquirers, or developers of raw materials. The manufacturers, the people who convert the raw material into slightly more processed goods, and the services. Now it's interesting here that services can't be resold and don't sit within the reseller framework. And we'll see that when we get into the services marketing chapter in a couple of weeks. What we also have is the business to business organizations. When we're looking at things like providing to government, to nonprofits, to charities where we have the provision of goods, services, and ideas to organizations, and particularly if we're looking at something like business to business or business to government aspects where we're dealing with supplying the government, you have a whole series of different protocols and requirements than you do in a classic business to business arrangement. Again, with this, what I want you to do is get a sense for the general area and overview and to decide whether this is something that in your assessment tasks you want to look at the business to business or the business to consumer angle for those tasks. Now one of the differences that we do have between business to business and business to consumer is that the business to business purchase decision differs from the consumer. In the consumer behavior chapter we talk about the buying process as being individual. In business to business, we look at it in terms of group purchasing. So that you have someone who can be the initiator. And again, in the definition, this would be the client rather than the customer. You all necessarily could actually be the customer, not the client, depending on how the initiator identifies that there's a problem. The user is the person who's going to be using the solution. And in essence, one of the things actually about this course is that you're the user of the textbook and I'm the one who made the decision to set the text to be available to be sold to you. So we actually had a business to business buying behavior take place in the setup for this course. The initiator again has the responsibility to say the purchase needs to be made, the user is the one who will be using the end result of the purchase. Gatekeepers are people who make the purchase decisions. Now a gatekeeper can be a policy or a person what they do is they change the dynamics of the market. A gatekeeper can lock out providers or have specific requirements that make the provision of a product to a business that little bit harder. Or there may be requirements. For example, the Australian government has a requirement to, wherever possible, source locally to improve local employment opportunities. Now that can be a benefit if you happen to be a local employer, or it can be a detriment if you happen to be playing from the global marketplace. You also have in the purchasing process, you have influencers. People who will not use the product at the end, people who are not responsible for making the purchase, but who have a way of either influencing the gatekeeper or affecting the decisions made, either through, say, for example, working in a university Whilst I use the computers and I'm the user, the purchase decision is initiated by a budgetary requirement, so it comes out of finance. The gatekeeper works in finance and handles the contracts and the calls for tender. And the influencer is the IT department who recommends what sort of equipment we should be looking for. The decider quite often is then the head of school. So you have 
a manager who will be the one who will sign off and say yes or no, will we buy this? And then it all moves down the channel to somebody who's actually responsible for pressing the button that says purchase. This complicates the process significantly. But what it also does is it opens up an opportunity to treat each of these roles as their own segment. Initiators are the ones who need to recognize that there's a problem. So that brings up the consumer behavior aspects of problem recognition. Gatekeepers are going to be the information sources. Influencers and deciders are people who will be worth lobbying, but whilst they don't have the final say, or the first say, they do have a significant influence that they can play. So marketing directly to an influencer or to a decider may in fact be more effective than marketing to the user or the initiator. Again, these are things that you need to be considering and thinking about who is your best target in an organization to get your point across that yours is the better of the products and then get that purchase made. So the buying decision process, if you look at this, what I'd like you to do with figure 6.3 is I'd like you to have this on screen, so either in the slide deck or pause the tape for a second. Then look at the consumer buying process and play compare and contrast. It's a good exercise early in the semester to get the practice of being able to look at something and go, well, what's similar and what's different? Why are the similarities important? Why are the differences significant? So for here, this is your exercise for you. Look at the materials and say, how do the two match up? What's different and why is that important? And what's similar and why is that important? Compare and contrast always come with the requirement that you have to make as strong a case for the comparison as you do for the contrast. So let's talk over the component parts. The problem recognition, again, it's a very similar looking aspect that we are still dealing with desired state and ideal state. You are still looking at a recognition of a problem, but you're also looking at this from a twofold factor. The organization itself can actually trigger by its own internal systems, a recognition of a state change or a desired state. For example, if you are designing and one of the things that's worth looking at when you're looking at Kickstarter, you're designing a product and you realize that you need to ship 10,000 units when initially you were planning on shipping 5,000 units. Now you have a state problem. You have a greater demand than you expected. So your current state is, I don't have enough supply. Your ideal state is, I have enough supply. Problem recognition triggers. You may also find that as you're going through this process, you trigger and re-trigger problem recognition. On information search, quite often the information search approach of a business is almost in the reverse to the way you would work as a consumer. From a business perspective, you quite frequently know what it is you're looking for. So you've got product specifications. You have specific requirements. For example, on Kickstarter, when you are printing a playing card, you know that if you're going to make a deck of cards, it's going to be 54 cards you need to have printed. Then you start with your design decisions. What are the color, the ink, the paper, the card, the card boxes. So you have a series of specifications that you have designed. Then you go looking to see who can match. And this is a quite often a reversal of the looking to see what's out there and seeing what the specifications are, which you do as a consumer. Look at the specifications to see what fits versus have specifications and try and find a market provider. You also at the information search stage quite often as a business will be doing a lot more calls for tender and putting out your specifications and asking someone to come to you and make an offer to you. The evaluation of alternative step, this is actually a lot more formal, but it's also still prone to consumer behavior. One of the things that uh, is a bit of the mythology of business to business is the idea of the rational business market. If that was true, we wouldn't have corporate hospitality and we wouldn't have a lot of effort being spent on wining and dining and influencing the buyers because it would all be a rational decision. Why would you need to influence the cognitive and emotive elements if the cognitive was only the dominant part? So you're looking here at Tenders, pitches, 
where people are coming, providers are coming to the organization saying, here are the options that we can provide you. How well does this fit your needs and how close is this match? What customizations are required? The product and supplier selection. Again, this is when you're starting to make the choice. You also have a series of factors in here that come up in terms of who is going to be the ideal audience and who is your end user. So the next day, I actually have to think, well, if I'm going to sell this to someone else, what are the facets of the product that my end user is going to want that my supplier can provide? For example, you want to make a customized 3D printed, high quality figurine. It's custom to for the end of season, trophy for each club. You want someone to be able to send in a series of photos, use a three D handheld three D scanner, and the best and fairest gets a small three D printed bust as a trophy for being the finest footballer on the field that season. If you want to set that up as your company and your operation, then you're going to need to find people who can match your specifications. You're going to need to have a high, you want this to be a high quality, a luxury, exotic product, printed in metal maybe. You're going to have to find someone who can do that to the specification you want. So now you're having to factor in things like quality, production quality, so that not necessarily also what you are looking at in terms of your costs, but what is it that your market, your end market, desires from the product? So if you want to be looking at these facets, it's one of the things, again, the Kickstarter campaign is one of the interesting things about tracking and talking to the Kickstarter people and looking at the uh, emails they send out about project tracking is quite often the samples that they've received from organizations do not match the product. Whether they're saying, oh yes, we have this high quality and I'll send you a really high quality sample, but when you actually get into mass production, it turns out to be less lower quality because it's a high quality when they're doing it in small batches where they can run 10 and take the best one, but when they're running 1,000, then they're going to give you all 1,000. So you want to be looking at this in terms of ensuring that what the suppliers are promising, the suppliers can deliver. The last part to this is very similar in terms of the post-purchase evaluation. And again, what we're looking at here is quite often a very formal evaluative process of shipping on time, quality matches, quality assurance matches. There's a lot of expectations that will be set up in advance. So quite often you'll come in with a purchase expectation and your post-purchase evaluation is a formal part of your marketing plan or your evaluative processes. All right, the last of uh, the elements of the business to business is when we start looking at the metrics that count inside B2B. Satisfaction, quality, engagement, intention, and problem resolution. Now these are quite obviously capable of being used in consumer behavior, but what you're looking at here in particular, what's of interest to you is when you get to customer engagement, one of the things that business to business does is because of the size of the transaction and the duration of the transactions, it's a lot easier to have a closer customer relationship and a working customer relationship. And this facet comes back when we start looking at things like services marketing, when we start looking at customer relationship management, and when we start looking at the idea of the ongoing loyalty and relationship management components that the idea of a business to business transaction being long term. So consumer behavior quite often is short term. You have a state change you need solved. You're a couple of drinks and a ham sandwich later. Your state change of hunger and thirst has gone away. You're not looking at staying at this particular restaurant then for the next week. Whereas in a business to business relationship, your problem is you're going to need to provision drinks and food on a regular daily basis. So you're going to need a fresh supply of drinks on a regular routine basis and you're getting a fresh supply of component parts. So the cafe is going to have the B2B long-term relationship which may get tinkered with, tweaked and negotiated and customized so that they can provide one-off transactions to their customers. All right, that's the business to business. It is the shortest, one of the shortest of the chapters if not the shortest, largely because we're a real consumer focused organization here at the ANU. 
as always, if you need me, contact by the way on the screen or connect across on Twitter at Stephen Dan or over the email stephen.dan at anu.edu.au.